Welcome to On Record PR, where we go on record with industry leaders to discuss best practices for public relations strategies that drive business success. Let's get started with the show. Hello and welcome to On Record PR. I'm Jennifer Simpson Carr, the producer and a guest host of the show. I am also the Director of Strategic Development at Fury Rubel Communications. Today we're going on record with David Hubbard, Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at Verizon. Before I bring David onto the show, I just want to read a little bit about him and his accomplishments. David leads Verizon's consumer marketing products, growth, and revenue legal team, which provides support for Verizon's portfolio of consumer businesses. He is the co-chair of Verizon's public policy, legal, and security, diversity, equity, and inclusion council, and also oversees Verizon's legal internship program. Anyone who has met David will not be surprised to learn that he received Verizon's Credo Award in July 2020 which honors employees who exemplify Verizon's core values, action, and have a positive mark on their teammates, Verizon's customers, and community in a significant way. He was also named to the Lawyers of Color Hot List in 2014, featured in Modern Council Magazine in 2016, highlighted as one of America's most influential Black lawyers by Savoy Magazine in 2018, and one of the nation's best lawyers of color in 2019. Prior to joining Verizon, David was an associate with Kelly Dry in Washington, D.C. He received his JD from Georgetown University Law Center and his BA cum laude from the University of Maryland College Park, where he was a Phi Beta Kappa and a Benjamin Bankier Scholar. He currently serves on boards of directors for a number of organizations, In addition, he and his wife, Tamiko Hubbard, co-founded Sweet Reads, a literacy-based non-for-profit organization dedicated to inspiring an early love of reading by providing children in underserved communities with books. I invite all of our listeners to learn more about David, his background and accomplishments by reading his full biography in the transcript on our website. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Jennifer. Happy to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to be talking to you today, and I do hope listeners take me up on reading your full biography. That was an abbreviated version of a very lengthy list of accomplishments, so I'm excited to talk to you. And for our listeners, David and I actually go way back. (laughs) Many, many years. Many (laughs) years. We met for the first time we figured out at PMA Marketing Law Conference in Mm -hmm. Chicago in 2011. Mm -hmm. I know the name of the conference has changed, but we were kindly introduced by some of my favorite attorneys from Davis and Gilbert. Yes. Still there. Yes. Ron Urbeck. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I know you were a speaker that year. I was there supporting the Davis and Gilbert team. And then recently we were reconnected through a mutual friend, Leslie Wolfson of ACC, New Jersey. Indeed. Wonderful woman that Leslie is. Yeah. So I'm I am so grateful for the the opportunity to reconnect with you and and thankful to uh to Leslie for making it happen. Yes. Um, so there are a lot of topics we have talking about today, including your role as general counsel and the important work of the counsel you're on for Verizon. And I'd love to at some point touch on sweet reads too. There's just so many things that so many different directions we can go, yeah. but but let's start with your role at Verizon. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do there? Sure, sure. Happy to do so. I currently serve as the lead for our consumer growth and revenue legal team. And what that means in in reality is that I'm the lawyer for our chief revenue officer for the consumer business. And then my me and my team have the great pleasure of providing support for Verizon's consumer products and services, and then consumer marketing. So anytime you're seeing Verizon really on TV, from advertisements to social media, to all of our, you know, internet, TV, mobile devices, phones, the like, all of our sort of consumer portfolio of products, services, devices, you name it, we get the great pleasure of of supporting the business on those from a legal perspective. It's pretty exciting. Uh, work because it's constantly changing and we get to really, really partner with the business very closely, which I've uh, very much enjoyed throughout the career. 
That's great. Thank you. And so can you tell us more about Verizon's Legal and Public Policy Diversity Council and what type of programming the council offers? Yes, absolutely. So we have actually have a long history in our legal and public policy organization for supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our council, I want to say it started with a different name well over a decade ago. In fact, I've probably uh, served on it for probably the last 12 or so years. But the council itself, our, our mission is, is really simple. We really exist to help support the hiring, retention, and advancement of uh, diverse legal talent, both inside Verizon internally and externally, where we partner with our law firm partners and industry, you know, bar associations and the like. We do a wide range of of programming throughout the department. I'll name a few, but um, if that goes from, you know, uh, we have six committees. Our pipeline and engagement committee supports our legal internship program. So I have the pleasure of leading and co-chairing that. We have a communications committee, which really puts out tremendous amount of content towards uh, to the organization focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're in the midst right now of a 21-day allyship challenge where uh, we allow people to sign up and they receive messaging and uh, on on allyship and programming every day. You know, and that includes things to watch internally, uh, videos and clips, fantastic articles and resources. And then we, you know, consistently communicate about the efforts of people in the department and other programming uh, that we have. We have a fantastic programs and content committee where we focus on a variety of programming for the organization. Well, upcoming, in fact, tomorrow, we are doing an anti-Asian hate AIPI reenactment of crucial trials, really that focus on, on hate crimes that were committed against our American, Asian, and Pacific Islander colleagues, and uh, really excited about that, where we actually will role play and play a role and and share that throughout the organization. We have viewing parties that are happening throughout the country as well, which is pretty pretty neat and exciting. We bring in a number of speakers to uh, really talk and focus on the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'd like to say we really try to focus on advancing DEI holistically. So we, uh, you know, we have a meditation series that we have partnered with a wonderful organization called Meditation for Leadership. We do a monthly uh, series that really focuses on various aspects of personal development, but leadership development. It was hugely important throughout the pandemic, for sure, for me personally, but for all of us to really spend some time reflecting on where where we were in, in our lives. The meditation series has been hugely, hugely well-received for the organization. And that's another example of the types of programs that we put on for the, for the department. I could go on and on. We have an international committee as well, which we realized uh, probably now a couple of years ago, Verizon's a global company. We have people everywhere, but we were very US-centric and we had left out some colleagues with some of our programming. And so some of the things that we were focused on here weren't necessarily resonating with our employees in Asia and, you know, in Europe and the like. So we actually uh, got together, created a committee, which has people from from across the globe, and they focus on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but they're different and they're tackling some different issues. And they've also been really important to help us learn more about our colleagues in other places across the across the globe. So uh, those are a few. I hope I'm not too long-winded with with this answer, Jennifer, because I could go on and will, which is... <laughs> <laughs> well, Verizon has incredible resources available to its employees, and it gives me the indication that they walk the walk. I mean, it's not just AAPI as an example of resources, really reenacting and allowing individuals to go through the process of what AAPI hate may look like. I mean, that that is really putting yourself and your colleagues in the shoes of others. And that's an incredible way to help that information resonate. I'm so impressed. And, and that was, it sounds like an abbreviated version of, of the resources that Verizon offers. So that's incredible. 
Oh, yes. Well, we want to make it real. You know, I think, and to your point, I think it's really been important for us and our council over the years with the great support of, of Craig Silliman, our, our general counsel as well, who has uh, really allowed us to take a lead, an industry lead, I would say, in terms of the types of programming and pushing and really, really trying to create a culture in our department that is inclusive, authentic, but also intellectually challenging. And so, you know, I focus on that to say that, yes, you can say that diversity, equity, inclusion is important. And yes, you can have uh, some programming, but we have really, really gone deep. I mean, over the past couple of years, we've had courageous conversations that have been very emotional. Uh, We created a cohort of empathetic conversations, which are small group conversations to allow us as colleagues who are not necessarily have shared or experiences throughout life, but to really spend time talking to each other about who we are and, and how we've been affected by experiences. And universally, people have been have commented that they've been so enriched by the opportunity to share, be vulnerable, communicate, and get to know colleagues better in ways that really we didn't do as much in the workplace. And so Verizon is, and we have, I say Verizon, but it is we, the employees that have created it, have created a really unique community and environment that I, I think we're all very proud of. Obviously, we that takes work. We have to continue to work, to have some challenging programming, to be honest with each other, recognize that we always have room for improvement and other things that we can can do. But I'm I'm really excited about all that we've accomplished over the years, for sure. Congratulations. That's amazing. Providing employees with an emotionally safe environment where they can have those, as you called them, courageous conversations is so important to personal and professional growth. And I appreciate the term, the phrase courageous conversations, because when we started this podcast a few years ago, Gina and others encouraged me as they were to have some challenging conversations, DE and I and and other conversations. And, And my instinct was, well, who am I to talk about that? And it was a challenge for me. And I took the step to have those conversations. And I personally feel enriched. I feel like I have learned so much and I have become a better ally through these conversations because it has opened doors to learning and you know conversations that that I never felt comfortable having because I didn't feel like it was appropriate for me to ask those questions or or who am I so that is phenomenal and I can just imagine how you know the culture that you've created how empathetic and and how aware each other is as a colleague of the issues other groups may be facing and being able to support them in a way that that helps them be the best that they can be in their roles, but also in their lives. Yes, absolutely. It was wonderful to hear you say that just about your journey here with the podcast, uh, Jennifer, because I'd like to say that the growth that we experience, right, it comes from expanding ourselves, right? It comes from those those times or those places where we're, we're a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, there's this great book that I love with, by Pema uh, Children. Uh, I hope I'm saying her name well, but it is uh, The Places That Scare You. And it's really about stepping into those uncomfortable places, right? Recognizing that in the end, and the, and the other side of going through things, we, come, we become better. And that our, our lives and, and our workplace is no different. And in so many ways, much of what we are trying to do is, is truly create that space of psychological safety but of challenge, right? And that doesn't, you know, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes I feel like when we're pushing issues of DEI, you know, yeah, it's a little bit uncomfortable to talk about some of these things in the workplace. And many workplaces don't want to do that. And I've really been grateful for the opportunity to have that level of support at Verizon, but also working with colleagues that have the courage to keep pushing, right? To keep pushing and and live in a a space that, you know, that, that can be challenging for us all. I I really appreciate that. And that resonates with me because I feel like we're a small team. We have 12 people right now, full-time, 
And every single person on this team is committed to learning and growing, even if it is a bit uncomfortable to get outside. And we know that that's how change happens. So I'm really excited to hear about the the things that you're putting into practice at Verizon and, and knowing that you've been a big part of that. You touched on a couple of things that I'd love to follow up on. The first is mental health. I heard you say that you started a meditation group and I know that the pandemic was a challenge for everyone in unique ways. What were some of the challenges you faced as in-house counsel at a mega company during the pandemic and and how did you overcome them or, or how are you still getting through them? Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you, you said that. I think it is an ongoing journey, right? Because we've entered and are entering a new normal. Right. In the new normal, we are most of us are in a hybrid working environment now. And I suspect that we'll be that way for years to come. But what it really means is for all of us, that's a period of change. And the pandemic was forced to change, similar to what we were talking about. I can recall leaving the office at the time of coaching basketball, and we had a game that was canceled that night of March 12th, 2020. And the thought was, oh, well, you know what? Wow, they canceled something in the NBA too. And we were told that we're going home from work, that we're not coming back to the office tomorrow. But in a couple of weeks, we'll all be you know, back. In like a week or two, we'll, we'll move right back to normal. And so you know, what you resist persists in many ways. And we all resisted the fact, because we didn't know it, that like this was going to be some life change, that I was going to necessarily go many, many months to a year and many people two years before you were even back in working in your office again. And as such, you had so many people who were were dealing with family issues, childcare concerns. How do you work in a household when, you know, there was one period where my wife and I were both here working out of the house. Both of our boys, we have uh, twin boys, we're here doing schooling remote. We're all going from video call or they're in classrooms and calls and the like. And we weren't moving, right? We were just here in our house for day after day, week after week, month after month. That was challenging. We were all going through similar things. That was just my journey, but everybody was going through. And that and those were challenges to our way of life. And candidly, the mentality that I had to have that worked for me, Jennifer, was I've got to embrace this. I've got to embrace the fact that I'm going through a period of change and get to know myself a little bit better because I have more time with myself than I ever could have possibly imagined at times, right? I got to the weekend and you're working and there's no place to go. Restaurants weren't open. We weren't traveling. We weren't getting away. There weren't sporting events. So like I was home, I was reading, I was meditating and I was able to really get to know myself a bit more and better. So I am a a person where the pandemic worked out really, really well for me. I feel like I grew a lot in terms of the whole know thyself model of of life and realizing how I'm fueled by strengthening my mind in ways that I hadn't before. At the same time, as leaders, and and this is a more direct answer to your question, I apologize for being long-winded, I have a team of people and attorneys who are all on a personal journey Mm -hmm. and who are all dealing with things differently. We had People in our families that went through COVID and health crises. We had mental health challenges with people who were going through bouts of, and I say mental health, but it's loneliness, depression, a ton of alcohol abuse and other things. And I'm not saying personally our team, these were just the realities that everybody was dealing with. And we had to make space for that. The fact that this is a change and we've got to get used to it. People had fatigue. We're looking at each other on Zoom and computer calls all day. And we're seeing kids run around in the background and dogs and animals. One of the things I said to my team, too, we had to make all of that okay, because that is the reality where we are living. You have to make it all okay. And we had to embrace the window that we got into each other's lives that we didn't have before, right? And so not only did I learn more about myself, but I learned a lot more about my colleagues in their own lives. And so, you know, I think I mentioned the meditation series that we did. That was really important. But one of the things that I did the most was increase and improve my meditation practice, as well as uh, really a practice of thinking more about other people too, whether you call that love and kindness or or the like, call it Tonglin. 
And trying to bring that to the workplace was important. I wanted to bring positive energy to my team in the midst of a time where we were seeing negative on the news constantly, constantly, constantly. You know, again, talking about the type of place and environment we want to have. You know, I really wanted to at least do my part to bring a vibe of positivity every day and try to stimulate happiness and joy. You know, I mean, I really think facilitating, and I, I use that word intentionally, but facilitating happiness and joy, like what better role to play in an organization than being a, the type of leader that really at least tries to do that, whether I succeed or not, I don't know. But that had to be an intentional aspect of the way to run a call. And so in any event, long-winded answer. I hope I answered your question. You absolutely did. And let's pause here to hear a message from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Furia Rubel Communications. Recognized as the number one agency by the National Law Journal, Furia Rubel helps top businesses and law firms with high stakes public relations and marketing, reputation management, crisis planning, and incident response, including high profile litigation media relations. To learn more, go to furiarubel.com or email podcast at furiarubel.com. I don't work with you every day. But several weeks ago, you and I had a quick prep call and it was very late in the day and you got on Zoom and you had a smile on your face and you were so uplifting. And partway through the call, you told me that your commitment that day was joy. And it was a long day for me. And I will tell you at the end, you were my last call of the day. It really resonated with me that you are a senior executive at a major company. And at four o'clock on a Monday or Tuesday, whatever it was, and you brought joy to that call and you made that call such a nice experience for me. And it resonated with me that you had committed to that in the morning. And so I can, I, like I said, I don't work with you that often, but I can imagine if that's how you present every day, you know, you pick something that you want to bring to your day, the impact that you are having on your colleagues. And that's amazing. Oh, thank you for saying that, Jennifer. I really, really, I'm trying to be intentional in life. And and to your point, I try to focus on joy and happiness and laughter. And I do, uh, I have created a practice of saying like, intentionally, what do you want to do? What do you want to communicate? You know, for our, for my journey this week, because we have a number of things and I have a a few speaking engagements where I've said like, you know, I really want to let peace and happiness speak through me this week. I really want to find a place where, because all that I think we're all seeking in life is the ability to, you know, be happy. There's this roomy quote that like, wherever I am, I am fine. And my interpretation of that right now is like, regardless of the circumstance of the day, I am always going to be okay. And I'm better than okay. Okay is almost like, you know, it's kind of like when I'm, I'm talking to my kids and I'm like, how was your day? And they're like, oh, it's fine. I'm like, it's got to be, can it be more than that? Can you give me a little bit? Something like, did good things happen today? Did bad things happen today? Did you? And by and large, I have been immeasurably blessed in my life. I have had just wonderful experiences. I've got this fantastic family. I work with tremendous colleagues who inspire me, who teach me, who educate me. I am um, truly, truly living this wonderfully incredible dream. And when I remind myself that this is a wonderful, wonderful world to wake up in, despite the problems, we had a weekend of horror in in Buffalo. We're recording this right after horror in, in Buffalo. And there was, you know, white supremacist ideology that he quoted where he went into a store and shot people. So there are horrible things that happen, but we live in a wonderful world nevertheless, right? And I and I don't say that to take light of the fact that exists, but in the face of horror, we do have to find that light that keeps us going, that keeps us positive. And I want to just help be a part of that positivity. I really appreciate you acknowledging the, the tragedy that occurred over the weekend. And certainly right now it's on everyone's mind, but I agree with your point. It is sometimes hard to do, but if you can dig down deep and identify some bright lights in this world, they're there. Something that you said earlier about being in the home so much resonated with me because 
during that period of time that you mentioned, where we were really all inside and everything was closed, there was a point in time, my parents live with us. Most people that know me know that they moved in after they retired. I have a seven-year-old. And there was a point in time where I was just so drained. I was not going outside. And I walked up the stairs at one point and barefoot, right? Because we're all working from home, just being transparent. (laughs) My mom looked at me and said, you haven't been outside in three days. Please go for a walk. And the thought of putting shoes and socks on was exhausting to me at that time. And so I looked at my daughter and I thought, she probably needs this too. And I said, why don't we throw on some flip-flops and why don't we take a walk? So we walked around the block, we talked, and that became what she now calls our flip-flop walk. She would wait for me to finish work. She would wait for me to come up. She'd have our flip-flops by the door and she's are we going to go on our flip-flop walk now? And so during this time that was so heavy, we couldn't leave the house. People were in masks at, you know, my husband was the only one going grocery shopping. The end of the day, which was so long for me, and then we were stuck quote, stuck inside after that turned into a time I looked forward to because there was a bright light waiting at the front door with my flip-flops and we would just go walk around the block and pick flowers and talk. And so I appreciate you sharing that perspective because that kind of moment in the pandemic changed my perspective and helped Mm -hmm. me a bit think more about where I can find the joy in the day that we had, Mm -hmm. regardless of where we're stuck inside Anyway, so thank you for sharing yeah. it. Now, now, my- no, that, no, thank you for sharing that. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. And you know, it's interesting as you were talking about the flip flop walk with your your daughter. The forced slowdown of the pandemic brought me so much time with my family that far more than I realized I was missing. And so, you know, I've always been one. Uh, you know, I love sports, and so anybody who knows me knows that I've love sports and I've had the pleasure of coaching my my boys for many years in basketball and soccer and the like and you know I've always made it a point to you know my day I'm going to get to the game and if I've got to get back in town like I'm going to be there right but what I didn't realize is as much as I was event focused I was missing daily dinner constantly because I was in the office like and I'm rushing home and you know, we're just throwing something in. My my wife would cook some wonderful meals and, you know, they have eaten and then here I come, you know, catching up right before they go to bed or the like saying hello and spending time. Well, gosh, having, you know, two years straight of dinner with the family in the conversations and time we were able to spend, so grateful for the ability to just slow down and realize how important that time is. And I was missing a ton of it. So similar to, as you were telling that story with the, you know, the walk with your daughter, just the time and conversations with my kids and my wife was just so, so awesome. And what a wonderful reminder of what we have right here all the time that we sometimes just don't pay enough attention to. I wanted to awaken to the blessings that I already, that we have, right? That's such great perspective. So through your journey then, are there are there any resources that you'd recommend for anyone looking for uh, information on meditation or mental health? Yeah, well, I would tell you for folks in this corporate world that we're in, I highly recommend partnering and reading the, the resources that Meditation for Leadership makes available. They have tremendous resources on their website. And, and I will tell you there, their partnerships uh, has been tremendous for us in our organization. So I'd be remiss if I didn't start there. We mentioned our, our lovely friend, Leslie Wolfson, and I do have the pleasure of serving on the ACC New Jersey board. And I've worked with Leslie a bunch on programming, which includes the mental health program that she's put together for ACC New Jersey. We're currently actually working on doing a meditation series later this summer with the uh, ACC. And by and large, uh, candidly, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And so I think there are some really, really fun and fantastic podcasts, whether it's, you know, Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday podcast to the Brene Brown to Lewis Howe's Schools of Greatness to The One You Feed. There's some really fantastic podcasts and I could go on and on, but just has so much wisdom there that are, are right at our fingertips when we get some time to just tap in. I read this book called The Daily Stoic every day, 
And there's also a Daily Stoic podcast that I highly, I highly recommend. And uh, the author is Ryan Holiday. Okay. (laughs) Showing it to you. For those who can't see us who are listening, uh, he did hold up the book so that we will take a screenshot of that and we'll link to all of those places in the transcript. And it's called the 366 Meditations on Wisdom, Perseverance, and the Art of Living. I find this to be a very nice, quick, and short book. I should have had a a couple of others here. That one happens to be on my desk at the moment. But I do, I have committed a a practice of reading a number of things, small in bites and listen to, to just help me get in the right frame of mind. And I highly just recommend for other people to, you know, my practice might not work for many, but find your, your own practice. I mean, you know, I love gospel music. I just listened to this gospel song this morning called Wait On You. That was part of my Peloton ride. But now that's part of my <laughs> process. I love that song. And it makes me happy and it brings me joy. So if I can like hear it at 645 in the morning, like that's going to help set the tone for my day. And so it's now part of, a you know, the process. Thank you for those resources. I do have a follow-up question, which is who is your favorite Peloton instructor? Oh, that's tough. Wow, Jennifer, that's tough. Because I would like to say, oh, I don't know. We'll see. I used to do a, a number of Chase Tucker classes before he uh, left Peloton. And he, I think, has a similar philosophy in life to me. Okay. Which is, you know, he would really focus on positivity and share sort of words of wisdom. But all the instructors are great. Yeah. I love Robin's courses. Mm-hmm. I love Jess Sims and her courses in Milwaukee. I love Jermaine Johnson. I love Kendall. Uh, you know, I've taken courses, yoga. I don't, I can't say I do a ton of, of yoga, but I do do the meditations there too. Chelsea Jackson Roberts, tremendous instructor, a DT in her meditations. And so I've probably, I've tested most of the instructors by now. And I can't say I found someone who I don't like or resonate yeah. with. Yeah. You know, I used to, when I started, I used to do a bunch of Alex uh, Toussaint rides and really enjoyed the intensity that he brings to the rides, yeah. right? So, so okay. he's my favorite. Yeah. Oh, is Alex your favorite? Yeah. David, not to digress, I got a shout out on my 100th ride by Alex, and I have the moment he said my name framed near my Peloton. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And well, he's, he's great. Yeah. He's great, too. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, but more, Pel- more Peloton stories to... To come. To hear, right? <laughs> so we're getting close to our, our, the end of our time together. I have two more questions for you. One changing kind of gears a little bit. We, I just want to talk a little bit more about the council. You mm. mentioned that your goals are attracting and retaining diverse talent. And I had the great pleasure of hearing you speak at legal week earlier this year and your session was on prioritizing actionable DEI metrics that matter. And a lot of the conversation revolved around the retention part, which I found fantastic. And you particularly talked on opportunities as a colleague, as a leader, as a mentor to open doors and provide opportunities and exposure for your diverse colleagues so that they're in front of the people who can help bring them up through the ranks and support their professional growth. So can you talk a little bit more about how people can view the responsibility that we each have to lift each other up and and open those doors for one another? Yes, absolutely. You know, so much, and I'm going to personalize this a bit. As a young Black attorney many, many years ago, I didn't see enough people who looked like me. I didn't have attorneys in my family to to speak to and get some guidance and advice. And I felt like, or not even, I just felt like I was playing it by ear and trying to figure out, figure it out as I, as I went. And my parents have always said, you know, part of their journey was to provide opportunities for me that I didn't have. And if I extrapolate that into the professional world, as someone who has been practicing in this field for a good while, I feel obligated and honored to be able to support the next generation in ways that I can provide access and assist in, in, in providing guidance and wisdom and, and some you know information, candidly, to young attorneys on their way 
because I remember what it was like to be on that journey. Now, that's one of the reasons why we've really focused on, you know, diverse talent with our pipeline internship program that we have at Verizon. We've also partnered with a number of law firms to provide those same opportunities. And we have executive sessions, mentorship opportunities internally and with interns as well, with a number of people who feel just like I feel it's so rewarding to provide an opportunity and really to help guide the journeys of young attorneys. And it's been really, really enriching to do that both internally at Verizon, but I I certainly know we've made a tremendous difference over the years where now I see some of our interns who've got these promising careers at uh, wonderful, you know, big firms and some are, have gone, you know, other paths, but they're practicing law and uh, speak really, really highly of the time that they've shared. And then, uh, you know, I believe in can I, which is my definition of, of constant and never ending improvement. And one of the things that we are, are doing now, this year, we focused on an HBCU pre-law internship. So we now are partnering with Greenberg and Trowick to start a program that focuses on HBCU students while they're in college and provides an internship opportunity uh, for them as they're considering law school and and preparing for law school to really understand and get an idea of what corporate in-house practice is like with Verizon and then major law firm practice at a a wonderful firm like Greenberg and Trower. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight the fact that we have an engaged excellence program that we've done. And this is not for college students or even law students, but it's actually for you know associates and young partners at law firms that are diverse. But we actually connect them with people internally and have them participate and speak in their areas of expertise where they'll come and put on you know a CLE or the like at Verizon or in even a broader uh, forum where people get to see how this fantastic talent and then consider them and develop that those relationships and networking. But for the next big case that we have that relates to this area of the law and uh, that Engage Excellence program has also been a huge, huge success, you know, where we're really just providing exposure. And sometimes proximity and exposure is all that we really need. And those are efforts to in- increase and enhance proximity and exposure of diverse talent to opportunities like this. That's fantastic. And thank you for sharing that. I think that gives our listeners a number of ideas, but also, again, highlights the great work that you're doing. And I did tell you I wanted to ask you about Sweet Reads, because not only are you creating so much change and and influence at Verizon, but you and your wife are also co-founders of this nonprofit organization. And I don't want to try to explain it. So could you tell us more about it and where people can learn more? Yes. I'll start with that so I don't forget. Okay. You can learn more about it. Uh, Sweetreads.org. You can find Sweet Reads on Facebook, Sweet Reads on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. My wonderful wife, Tamiko Hubbard, is the executive director. And now to tell the story of the organization, I think Sweet Reads is like the most impactful work that we do. And we were able to witness our boys light up when they started reading books. Their worlds changed, their imagination changed. You know, forget about just the academic things, right? Their vocabulary increased, their desire to read and learn, and their ambition for knowledge increased as they were reading books as three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds. And one thing we know is that there are a number of people mainly underserved and unfortunately far too often people of color in this country that don't have access to books. And I mean just books to read, to stimulate the minds of of children. And Sweet Reads exists for that purpose. It is to help get books in the hands of children to inspire a lifelong journey and love of reading and learning. And that's really fundamentally what the mission is. Now, we've had wonderful partnerships with with Barnes & Noble and a number of organizations, Success in Motion, which are schools and, and, and partners with schools all throughout New York City. We've had the pleasure of now delivering books from, you know, throughout the Northeast to Missouri, to Puerto Rico, to Haiti, to uh, Nigeria. I mean, all over uh, Ghana. They're just tremendous to help build libraries all across 
in these places. So students and have access to to books and, you know, all nonprofits. We appreciate any donations, support, partnership that, you know, that people have and see fit. It is just a tremendous, tremendous journey. And it is our way of trying to have an impact and a positive impact on our greater community. That's wonderful. And we will certainly link to the website and the social media channels that you mentioned. Thank you so much for joining me today. I could talk to you for hours. I can't keep you on Zoom. I know you have other things to get to, but this was a wonderful conversation. I completely appreciate you being so candid and and open and honest about the pandemic and other things going on in the world. And I just thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate this opportunity to to share the time with you. And I'm so happy we've reconnected. Yes. And thank you so much for this, for this opportunity. So I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. And thanks to our listeners. Thank you for listening to On Record PR. Visit our website, onrecordpr.com to subscribe to the show, share it with your friends on social media, find show notes, additional episodes, and more information. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, feel free to send us questions or show ideas at podcast at onrecordpr.com.